Welcome to Back to the Text Themselves, a series on phenomenology. Today's video examines sections 78 to 83, the final chapter of Heidegger's Being and Time. Pause for a moment and consider how time matters to you. Sometimes I have time, and other times I have none. Sometimes I can take the time for something, other times I can't. Sometimes I can even lose time or gain time. Where is it that we take time from? Is it something that can be possessed? Is it even something at all? This leads us to another question. What makes time something real to us? One response is that time becomes real in the now, the present moment. After all, is not so much of the self-help advice we encounter often entailing some kind of being in the moment, not getting lost in the past and future, not getting lost in what is not real. Only the present is real, it is claimed. Putting aside what might be some legitimate psychological benefit to mindfulness, we must more closely consider the metaphysical presuppositions embedded in such claims. What exactly makes this now so real? Where is this so-called now? Is it now? Well, that now is no longer now. And what about now? Sorry, it's gone again. It seems we've stumbled across an odd situation. The present that is now is claimed to be the most real thing, and yet its duration is so minute, so exceptionally intangible, that we can perhaps conclude that the present is really nothing at all an illusion of duration experienced by consciousness, which constructs an imaginary present moment out of the ebb and flow of experience. But then this would lead us to conclude that what is most real is consciousness itself, and that would return us to all sorts of philosophical quandaries too profound and complex to unfold right here. But perhaps the problem is in the way we've understood time in the way we have prioritized the presence and have linked it to being itself. This final chapter of Being in Time examines how time is most readily available to us and how we reckon with time, that is, how we take account of it, leading to a consideration of what it means to be in time and the relation of this time to temporality. As is well established by now, Dasein is defined by care, which is the unity of our being ahead of ourselves through projection, being always already in the world as thrown into it, and being together with others in our entangled everydayness. In focusing on time rather than temporality, we consider time as it makes itself available to this everydayness, whereby we make things present through awaiting, retaining, and acting. Each of these entails a certain awareness of time that is much more familiar to us. Through awaiting, I encounter the later on, or the thens, as when I say to myself, if I eat now, then I won't be hungry later. Through retaining, I think of what was earlier, or on that former occasion, and what will be called going forward as the agos, as in, five days ago, I dot dot dot. Finally, these thens and agos are acted upon in terms of a now. That is, there is a making present, sometimes in a manner that retains, other times in the mode of forgetting. This latter situation happens when we get so caught up in the present nows that we are absorbed in the right now and the right away. These thens, agos, and nows account for what Heidegger calls time's datability. Datability has to do with a manner of making present that is familiar to us. Datability always derives from temporality as the most proximate manner that time is given to us. And it is in the sense of being datable that time can be gained or lost, had or not had. When I have no time, for example, it's because I'm busily losing myself in the situation nearest by, becoming absorbed in it. This is especially the case because this datable time is not my time at all, but the time of the they, who takes and gives away time. And so this time that emerges out of my being together with others, Heidegger calls share time or public time. 
Public time is the time in which interworldly beings are encountered within a surrounding world in my being together with others. Yet more fundamentally, it is in being thrown into a world, always already finding myself among such beings, that Dasein is first able to make use of these beings to tell the time, giving rise first to so-called natural clocks. Such natural clocks are exemplified in the readiness to hand of celestial beings, and in particular the sun. When the sun rises, I make use of that to tell what time it is to rise and work. When the sun sets, it's time to sleep. Due to its regularity, the sun makes itself accessible and discoverable as something like a clock. Yet this most ancient manner of telling time, of measuring time, is made possible only because we were first thrown into a world. The Dasein is always already temporal, and as such, Heidegger can write that temporality is the reason for the clock. In addition to datability, the telling of time is always anchored in the for the sake of which of our potentiality of being. In other words, there is a significance to measuring time. It's always done in view of the worldliness of the world, that is, the totality of relevance that makes things like telling time meaningful to us. A transformation occurs as we transition from so-called natural time to so-called artificial time. That is, time told more directly by innerworldly beings that we have manipulated through the use of technology in order to induce a more precise measurement of time. First, we measure time by the ebbs and flows of the rising and falling sun. Then we measure time more precisely through the use of a sundial and the position where the shadow falls on it. Then, with the invention of mechanical clocks, we could measure minutes and seconds. These days, we can measure time at such exceptionally small increments that we have no ability to even wrap our minds around the smallness of these measurements. Yet, as public time becomes more and more precise, something strange happens. Whereas time used to be more explicitly predicated upon its relation to the natural world and its cyclical rhythms, these relations become hidden, and instead time takes on a kind of independent reality, reducible to a number and standardized on the present now. Time becomes reduced to that which measures, which leads to a view of time as a series of discrete and sequential now moments. Furthermore, this abstracted view of time entails the leveling down of all of time to these now moments. The future is simply a now moment that hasn't happened yet. The past? a now moment that's no longer here. Every time is neutral and homogeneous with every other time, and any sense of time as originating from datability and significance gets covered over. With time being extracted from this primordial context, time itself no longer has any particular relation to the world, nothing is intrinsically significant about time, and any relation and significance attributed to time are merely superimposed upon it rather than deemed intrinsic to it. Furthermore, since every now moment is the same as every other now moment, the only now that becomes real is the present moment, with every past now moment and future now moment being a kind of deficient version of the present now moment. Now the present is all there is, an eternal present that serves as a cup whose contents come and go. What is removed from this transformation is any notion of finitude. Primordial temporality is marked by the limits of our thrownness and our death. The intrinsic finitude related to time derives from this situation. Yet in covering over this primordial origin of time, we come to treat time as if it were infinite. Since time is no longer connected to death, to finitude, there can no longer be any definitive end to these nows. Now, of course, I may not be around any longer at some point, but nows will never stop arriving. Indeed, it's impossible to envision the end of time if it is conceived of as such. Even if, as the physicists claim, the universe is slowly crawling toward total entropy, we cannot envision there being an end to these now moments. It's perhaps also why we have difficulty in understanding that there is no before time in a physical sense. And this is why we might get a question like, what was there before the Big Bang? The physicist may understand this question to be nonsensical because time originates with the Big Bang, but from our ordinary conception of time, the idea that there can be a start to time makes no sense. These 
sequence of nows just go on infinitely toward both directions, past and future. And so this leveling down of time to a sequence of nows and the covering over of datability and significance, along with the implicit conception of such time as infinite, gives rise to what Heidegger calls the vulgar or ordinary conception of time. In section 82, Heidegger goes on to show how Hegel's conception of time is in fact a highly refined and well-considered articulation of this ordinary time. As Heidegger writes, Hegel's conception of time presents the most radical way in which the vulgar understanding of time has been given form conceptually. How is this the case? According to Heidegger, Hegel conceives of space as unmediated, undifferentiated, abstract multiplicity. Although space is undifferentiated, it does differentiate. By this, I think is meant that space is nowhere in particular, but through space, different things may become individuated from one another. Thus, space is essentially a kind of negation. Yet this negation is negated through time. Time's negation of negation is named punctuality. That is, time as the now point at which, out of the indifference of space, a point of differentiation emerges. This point rebels against the shapeless, undifferentiated mass of space, taking a kind of individuated quality. This sequence of now points gives rise to a definition of time then as intuited becoming. Time is a relentless flow of non-being into being, and then being back into non-being, with being as a kind of negation of non-being instantiated in this now point. Consequently, all that is, all being, is simply moments of this eternal now, which marks another link between Hegel's conception of time and Heidegger's presentation of ordinary time. Heidegger quotes Hegel here, who writes, in the positive sense of time, one can thus say that only the present is, the before and after are not, but the concrete present is the result of the past and pregnant with the future. Thus the true present is eternity. Spirit for Hegel falls into time, and like time, spirit manifests as a kind of negation of negation as well. This is because the essence of spirit is the concept, and concept is defined as the form of thinking that thinks itself, a kind of self-reflexivity. But spirit can only do this by first grasping what is other than itself, the non-I. And in turning to the famous analysis of the master and bondsman, the master only becomes a consciousness in reflecting upon his difference from the bondsman, who he's not. The point of this consideration of Hegel is not to claim that this is a fair or accurate representation of his thought, but only to show how Heidegger interprets Hegel's conception of time to be the most refined version of what he calls ordinary time, and how he thinks so much of Western philosophy culminating in Hegel has been ensnared in this conception, failing to recognize how this time is itself derivative of a more primordial understanding of it. The existential analytic, in contrast to Hegel's dialectic, begins with the concrete facticity of throne existence in order to reveal temporality as what makes existence primordially possible. Spirit does not first fall into time, but exists as this very primordial temporalizing of temporality. When spirit falls, that is, when Dasein falls, it only falls out of primordial authentic temporality and into the entangled interestedness of the they. And this summary, I think, exemplifies what has been the remarkable contribution by Heidegger. Philosophers traditionally begin with a principle or metaphysical presupposition that then gets worked out in its imperfect instantiations of everyday life. It is a very Platonizing mode of thinking and is something Heidegger sees rampant in Western thought. But the question is, does this have to be the starting point for philosophical thought? Must truth begin and principally remain in the abstract? Or is there a way to acquire a philosophically rigorous concept by beginning with how we already experience our everyday concrete lives? In doing so, he has taken us through quite a journey, whereby we visited perennial philosophical topics, being, time, space, truth, etc., and seen them become radically transformed from their traditional formulations through Heidegger's method of beginning with our everyday encounter with these concepts as living concrete phenomena. 
Now, there's a lot I don't agree with here on Heidegger and what Heidegger concludes. And we're going to see, as we continue on in exploring other phenomenologies, what some of the disagreements have been. From the inadequate treatment of the body, the prioritization of authenticity over ethics, to the over-reliance of this subject who is not a subject called Dasein. But though I do, to varying degrees, find myself aligning with many of those criticisms, it would be impossible for me to deny how consequential his thought has been for most philosophies that do not call themselves analytic. And even then, Heidegger has had some notable indirect influences in certain strands within the analytic tradition. What I most appreciate about Heidegger's thought is that one does not have to agree with the particularities of his analyses, and despite many finding it obtuse and obscurantist, patience and humility in working through his texts can yield a profoundly transformative effect on our own thinking. And this is because Heidegger does not merely deliver an argument, but at the same time teaches us what it means to think, to think passionately and rigorously, it's probably for this reason so many who took his courses would find themselves utterly mesmerized by his teaching. This is because he doesn't at first teach one what to think, but more importantly, how to think. And how to think in a manner that may be painful and mind-stretching, but that ultimately leaves you incapable of thinking like you used to. And that's a quite a remarkable achievement, and one hard to appreciate until you've gone through the necessary work. I hope this video series has helped make his work a bit more accessible, but without giving you the impression that you don't need to read the text yourself. My videos are only attempting to be an imperfect vessel through the text, but in the end, there's no substitute for going back to the text themselves. Thank you all for taking this journey with me and for your words of encouragement and thoughtful questions along the way. I look forward to the next stage of our journey as we continue to return back to the text themselves to deepen our understanding of and appreciation for the ongoing merits of phenomenology. If you found this video helpful and it's within your means, please consider making a super thank you tip. You can find the super thank you button below. If you wish to be an ongoing supporter of this channel, you can do so on Patreon where I offer video transcripts and unedited materials. The link is in the video description. I want to thank the following for already supporting this channel on Patreon. You can also support this channel by liking and sharing this video and subscribing to my channel. As always, thank you for watching. And until next time, be well.